like to oh thank you and we're recording the meeting uh, i would like to um, acknowledge that our meeting is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Ghana people and i wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners on the land of the land i would also like to pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging and i will throw over to sarah to introduce our guest speaker for today thanks sarah thank you very much and I did have Kate's very impressive, um, here it is. <laughs> and then I went, I went and looked at something else, didn't I? So Kate, thanks so much for joining us today. Kate Swaffer, for those who don't know, is an independent researcher and author and an award-winning campaigner for the rights of people with dementia and older persons in Australia and globally. With a Master in Dementia Care, a Bachelor of Psychology, a Bachelor of Arts, a Graduate graduate diploma in grief counselling and she's also a retired nurse. Kate is the co-founder and past CEO and chair of Dementia Alliance International and an elected board member of Alzheimer's Disease International. No there's, a lot, <laughs> there's a lot, oh okay, there's a lot more in her bio but I think I will let Kate um, introduce herself and her topic for us today. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome everyone. And really special thanks for making time to be part of this network to start with, but also to join today. Uh, I'm, I'm never quite sure where to start. So what I decided to do, uh, even though the slides that I sent Sarah were more focused on um, the impact of COVID on people with dementia and a presentation that I did in London, um, at the ADI International Conference. Um, we have more time, uh, Sarah's, Sarah and, and Elizabeth have allocated more time. So I've added more things in. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just start from what for me was the beginning, which was kind of diagnosis. Now, am I able to share slides, Sarah? We didn't even yes. get around to checking that. So no, we were chatting. Yep, good, we were too busy doing what girls do best, talking. Um, so I, I, I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on people living with dementia, as well as new and old perspectives. Um, and uh, as Elizabeth said, I, I, I would like to just acknowledge that I work and live on the Ghana country and pay my respects to elders um, past, present and emerging. So I'll, I'll start with oh whoops i've lost my slide can we cut that bit out <laughs> yes uh, i've lost my there we go um so i'll just do a very quick global overview of dementia um there are currently well in 2019 there were an estimated 55 million people living with dementia and almost 10 million new cases every year there are other uh reports that estimate there were 57 million in 2019. But regardless of the data, that's a lot of people. Uh, in 2021, the Alzheimer's Disease International World Alzheimer's Report estimated there was at least 42 million people with dementia, but they don't have a formal diagnosis. Um, dementia is a major cause of disability and dependency amongst older people globally and, of course, people like me who were diagnosed uh, before the age of 65. Um, just in terms of disability data, there are 1 billion people living with some form of disability. Uh, yet people with dementia continue to be excluded from disability advocacy. And more importantly, from my perspective, as someone living with dementia, from disability support. Um, to me, that is a travesty of justice. Dementia is, according to the WHO, the seventh leading cause of death globally among all diseases. And in Australia, it's the leading cause of death in women and the second cause of death overall. Um, unpaid informal carers average five hours per day providing care. I would have to say that I know a lot of care partners, family members, who probably provide 20 plus hours a day. So I'm not sure how accurate that figure really is. 
Um, but I do know from personal experience and from meeting people with dementia through Dementia Alliance International and all over the world at events and meetings that we are frequently being denied the basic rights and freedoms that everybody else receives. So most people only see the deficits of dementia. Um, what I ask everyone to do is focus on what we can do because there continues to be a gross underestimation of the, the capacity of all people with dementia, even in the latest stages. And an example of that, I, I, I had an example of that when I was a young nurse. I finished my nurses training in the country, moved to the city, uh, worked, my first job was in aged care and a dementia, ironically, the first secure dementia unit in Adelaide. And uh, yeah, you go in under your profile and you look in I'm there. Gonna wait for people to mute. Could I, Donna, yeah. could I ask you to mute, please? Yeah. Often I'll be on the GP Hill somewhere or on East. Sarah, as host, you can actually mute anyone who enters. Um, so this lady, I was told by the senior staff, was mute. She didn't talk. Don't waste my time on her. Um, that to me was tragic. And so I guess the I spent a lot of time with older relatives as a child and had friends who were much older. So that was kind of the reason for me to actually spend a bit more time with this lady. And she was always immaculately, wanting to be immaculately dressed. She was a single woman, never had children, never had a husband. She'd been, in fact, an elite Australian golfer. And she never, ever spoke to me out in the ward. And people with dementia were in four-bed wards and often strapped to beds, shackled to beds or strapped to chairs. And one day in the bathroom, I took her to, for a, to the bathroom, to the toilet and you know you know, anyone in the audience today who's been a nurse um nurses are busy care workers are busy it's a busy job and i said to this lady oh could you hurry up and have a wee and she looked at me and she winked at me and she said you could just go and have a wee for yourself and i said to her I won't use her name. I knew you were, could talk. Why won't you talk to people? And she said to me, the rest of the staff treat me like a moron. Why would I waste my breath? And that to me was such a good lesson as a young nurse to help me understand that everyone has capacity. In fact, even if they can't talk, they still have capacity, but often people just give up especially people with dementia because people talk over them or assume that they no longer have capacity. But for me, um, most people often have only seen the deficits and yet that I have chosen to work hard to live positively with dementia is a bit of a conundrum because I'm regularly defamed and accused of not having dementia simply because I don't look like I have dementia as if there is a certain look. So if I could see you all right now, I couldn't tell if anyone in the audience here today had heart disease or diabetes or cancer. And I mean, maybe unless you had lost your hair from chemotherapy, there isn't really a look for dementia. So most of all, I ask that everyone sees the person and not the dementia and many other people follow that mantra. So dementia from the inside out, this is my experience of having been diagnosed with dementia, uh, a married working mother studying a double degree part-time um, with two teenage children. Immediately after diagnosis, I felt like I was being treated as something other to a real human being. And things that I would was doing seemed to be held to a high account. And in the last 14 plus years, it's over 14 years since my diagnosis, um, I really have started to understand what other marginalised groups experience in terms of the isolation and 
and I, I even amongst a crowd sometimes I feel deeply lonely and the stigma and discrimination which hasn't gone away that loss of self-esteem and self-identity because once I was diagnosed with dementia my doctor stopped looking at me stopped talking to me insisted I have somebody else attend my appointments and talk to them not to me it took me three years to kind of rectify that um, there was a loss of valued roles at home uh, and also in society and uh, you know once I got dementia I suddenly broke the statistical odds of a being a hundred percent wrong all of the time so if the kids left their lunch at home it was my fault because I had dementia that's that's a kind of candid example but it did used to happen and it took took my family a couple of years to kind of um, allow me to have some sense of power balance back in my family. There was definitely a reduced, um, less referrals and access to normal allied healthcare and other healthcare that everybody else gets. Um, definitely a deep sense of otherness um, that the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about. Um, I often still don't feel valued or respected equally to everybody else. Many still prefer to speak about me rather than to me. I, I, we, uh, and I attended my last dementia-specific in-person conference in earlier this year. I don't plan to attend any more. Um, and even there, people were going up to my husband and asking him, how's Kate doing? Instead, and he would say, well, she's just over there. Why not go and ask her? And they just disappear. So the stigma and the isolation and that sense of otherness will never go away whilst people don't truly value and respect people living with dementia, the same as they do everybody else. Um, I am currently, uh, it, it, when I was first diagnosed, I was often excluded from advocacy opportunities. But now, because I have a different opinion often to service providers or advocacy organisations, I'm actively excluded from a number of advocacy opportunities. Um, ageism is evident even for me, having been diagnosed at the age of 49, because dementia is still perceived by many as an older person's condition. In fact, my youngest son, who was 16, and we sat down with our kids and talked to them about my diagnosis. And my youngest son laughed and he said, oh, that's ridiculous. Mum, isn't that a funny old person's disease? And we all laughed at the time, but it actually wasn't that funny. Um, and then since being diagnosed, there have been many, many, many examples of um, violations of my basic human rights. And I know we've got some people in the audience today who, who have been working hard um, on understanding that. So one of the things that I constantly talk about with dementia is that it's a constant process of loss, grief and change. But sadly, the loss and grief and changes that I have to cope with and most other people have to cope with every single day is not validated and it's not adequately supported. I worked as a volunteer in suicide, grief and loss, and I studied grief and loss. And there is no support of the grief and loss that people with dementia experience. In fact, I tried to access some support earlier this year through one of our national peak organisations and was told it's only available to families and carers. What about my grief and loss for having lost the ability to do simple maths? I can't even use a calculator. And I come from a position of a relatively high IQ and a very high level of ability with maths and English and language, and I can, I can no longer spell that, and I can't use a calculator. There's a lot of loss and grief 
that people with dementia experience, but that's not being supported or even acknowledged. So 2022 is almost over. Can we believe that? My goodness, it's September. It's Dementia Awareness Month or World Alzheimer's Month. But quite frankly, nothing's changed. In the last three plus decades of advocacy for change, including advocacy from people with the lived experience of dementia, people who are care partners of someone with dementia. And these days, the relatively wealthy charities uh, who work in dementia advocacy, people with dementia are still being told to go home and get their end of life affairs in order, which I refer to as prescribed disengagement. Every single report and research article that I read tells me that the stigma and discrimination persists, it hasn't changed. Negative attitudes towards people with dementia have not improved and the World Alzheimer's report last year um, told us that even 60 something percent of doctors thought there was nothing you could do for people with dementia. Rehabilitation and other enabling post-diagnostic support that supports independence is not being provided. Many human rights and disability rights are still being violated and dementia is not being managed as a condition causing multiple disabilities. Therefore, disability assessment and support is not being provided and this applies to older persons with disabilities due to dementia. In my own case, because I'm under 65, I was able to access the NDIS. The NDIS knew very little, maybe nothing, about dementia, but they knew all about how to support me to keep living my life. You contrast that with aged care services, dementia services, most of those staff know almost nothing about dementia either, so that's no different. But they also know nothing about supporting my disabilities. So we really do, in my opinion, and I don't think we need to wait for vast amounts of expensive research, we need to start not only acknowledging dementia causes multiple cognitive and other disabilities, we need to actually start supporting people as people with disabilities. Um, the other issue that I have around dementia and Christine Bryden, who was diagnosed at the age of 46 in the last century, and James, she's from Australia, and James McKillop, who was diagnosed in the last century with dementia living in Scotland. Um, it is still too often about us without us. And almost every week I see a dementia event or conference that doesn't include a speaker with a lived experience. Uh, and then there still continues to be tokenistic and what I've discovered is very selective inclusion of people with dementia. So if you happen to have a different opinion on a topic that's being discussed in a focus group or a consultation or a conference, then you are proactively left out of the conversation. So that a lot needs to change in dementia land. So I think we need to reframe dementia. We need to move into the 21st century, even though we're 22 years into it already, we haven't quite got there. Um, if we reframe dementia as a condition causing cognitive and multiple other disabilities, we then reinforce the rights for people with dementia as per the, the CRPD. This approach supports a disability and social model of care. And more importantly than that, it's gonna move us away from the predominantly medicalized deficits-based lens of dementia. Um, it is up to us, all of you in this Zoom room and everybody working in dementia to ensure equal access to the Declaration of Human Rights, which was as far back as 1948, to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and its optional protocol, to OPCAT and to all of the other conventions. And there is an older persons convention currently being, I guess, negotiated worldwide is, is what I will say. I'm not sure we need it, but we're gonna get it regardless. Um, but it's important, these human rights conventions and treaties are really important. 
So dementia symptoms as disabilities has huge potential to improve outcomes for people like me who live with dementia, for our families, but also for governments and for service providers uh, and to civil society. We know that dementia is not only defined as a major cause of disability globally by the WHO, and dementia is a disability also under the Equality Act 2020 because it causes long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their, a person's full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. And I know from personal experience that my participation in society is no longer on an equal basis with anyone else. So why then, we have to ask ourselves, why then are healthcare professionals, and I, I spend a lot of time with researchers as well, researchers are refusing to, not refusing to acknowledge dementia causes disabilities, but they're refusing to include disability support and access to disability services in post-diagnostic pathways. They're preferring to stick to the chronic progressive illness deficits-based condition. I, I honestly believe if they moved away from this deficits-based chronic health um, paradigm, we would have the potential to increase independence for longer and reduce the human and economic cost of dementia. I'm currently working with a researcher whose focus is on um, health. She's a health economist, uh, and uh, I'm hoping that we can, that I can inspire a project about the health economy of moving from chronic health condition to a condition causing multiple disabilities for dementia. So, dementia and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the CRPD, um, there have been multiple violations of my rights and, as I see it, of everyone's rights, particularly those living with dementia. So I don't have equal recognition under the law. There's all sorts of arguments about legal capacity and, and there's access, lack of access, to equal justice for people with dementia. I don't have um, access to Article 19 of the CRPD. Nobody else other than me, who is lucky enough to be able to afford it, provides me with disability support to allow me to live independently and to be included in my community. Um, the denial of universal health coverage, including rehabilitation, uh, is global. It's a global issue. We are denied full access and, and particularly older people, um, be, partly due to ageism, are denied equal access to universal health coverage and definitely we're still being denied access to rehabilitation. Um, there's a denial of equal inclusion and social participation. And there are a number of articles of the CRPD that relate to that. And in my own personal case, when I declared to my employer that I was diagnosed with dementia, I was walked out the door on the Friday of that week. So we're not being provided with opportunities to remain employed, or if we're older, to volunteer and participate actively in our communities we aren't being provided with reasonable accommodations um, as we would if we had a hearing disability or sight disability or mobility disability. So the, the violations of the rights of people with dementia go on and on and on. And this is just really, this slide is about what's happened to me personally, but I think if I went further and talked to more people with dementia, I would need about five slides to be able to fill that up. So the lived experience of people with dementia before COVID was the experience of stigma, discrimination, isolation, lack of universal health coverage, including rehab, 
denial of dementia as a disability, denial of some of the most basic human rights, institutionalisation when we need uh, assisted living, segregation, high levels of physical and chemical restraint um, in nursing homes, but probably also in the community. There's not enough data for me to add that there. High levels of abuse, violence and neglect in nursing homes, but probably also in the community. And probably for me, the worst thing is that there's been a labelling of what I see as normal human responses to a very difficult diagnosis, which is called dementia. And they've been labelled as neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia and were referred to as BPSD. And now, you know, there's a new way they're calling them responsive behaviours, unmet needs and a whole range of other things. But basically, the human rights of people with dementia pre-COVID were completely ignored. The lived experience of people with dementia. Many, many people have said to me through support groups and online cafes at DAI, actually, nothing's changed. Welcome to our world. I can remember saying that to somebody. What's changed for me with COVID? Actually, almost nothing. Family and friends already socially and physically distance themselves from me. The stigma is not worse. It's the same as it was before COVID. The discrimination is actually not worse for me than it was before COVID. The loneliness is about the same, the isolation is the same. Uh, and one of our members said, from the time of diagnosis, we become increasingly isolated as family and friends quietly disappear. And I, I have heard people with dementia who are very active as advocates say that it's very different for them since COVID. And that's, I suggest that that is because becoming an advocate, you get your life back you get back to living. And so they've stopped experiencing the loneliness and the isolation uh, and the social and physical distancing as much as people who aren't advocates. And so they've had a more non, a person without dementia experience to COVID than the majority of people with dementia. So care partners and families and friends the ones I've talked to over the last two and a half years, they say that there's been minimal change to their world. Their human rights they see as having been um, denied and they say the same about the people they support. Um, they experienced social and physical distancing before COVID. They experienced stigma before COVID. They experienced discrimination and loneliness and isolation before COVID, and many of them have said to me, exact, I, I was quite surprised, exactly the same as I said to someone once, welcome to my world, they've said, welcome to our world. And one family care partner said to me, almost no one visited my loved one or helped me before COVID, so what's the difference? So we have to really start to think about what has COVID done? It hasn't caused all of these problems. It's really just highlighted them. They were happening long before COVID. So people living with dementia in residential care, uh, I, I, I've kind of had a, I don't know, I've had a lot of questions in my mind about why it's taken COVID to force some change in residential care particularly and the data, and I can provide referencing, but pre-COVID in Australia, 7% of people living in nursing homes received regular visitors. There were very low levels of meaningful person-centred activities, very low levels of exercise and allied health services in nursing homes and of activities in the community. And I can say from personal experience as a legal guardian of three people who have died of dementia in aged care, we actually had to pay private allied health providers to go into the nursing home to provide the basic stuff that we promised, such as physiotherapy. 
Um, but post-COVID, there's a very high percentage of families complaining about not being able to visit people living in nursing homes. There's been a massively increased focus on providing meaningful person-centered activities, such as creative window engagement, um, nursing homes, you know, finding ways to provide iPads for their residents and other uses of IT and virtual reality and an increased interest in the lack of exercise and allied health services in, in the care provided to re residents and an increased interest in the lack of activities in the community. So I don't have any answers to the question, but why is it taking COVID for us to start thinking about this, us, the dementia sector, to start thinking about it? So could there be positives due to COVID? I think so, because there has been an increased focus on improving community and residential care. There's been an increased understanding through the lived experience of stigma and a focus on reducing stigma. So people without dementia now understand the experiences of stigma, of isolation, of social distancing, physical distancing, of discrimination, of having their rights taken away. People without dementia now understand what it feels like to be physically restrained, not allowed to leave home because of COVID. Um, others now have the experience of being segregated from their colleagues, their family, their friends, and the community at large, which equates to secure dementia units. Um, and the increased neuropsychiatric symptoms due to the normal human responses of people without dementia to their experiences of COVID ha has, it, it, we know about. Um, so the current medical model of dementia care is very, in my opinion, very outdated to 20th century view of dementia. In 2015, the OECD report called Addressing Dementia, the OED response concluded but people with dementia receive the worst care in the developed world. So not in the developing world, but in countries like Australia and Canada and England. And the only change that I've seen to this really outdated diagnostic pathway, which was, um, that's an image from the book that I wrote in 2016, What the Hell Happened to My Brain Living Beyond Dementia, that was basically all that I was offered. And the only change that I've seen since the OECD report in 2015 is the addition of palliative care. Even after 20 years of formal inquiries, probably 20, maybe 21 inquiries, and then the Australian Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety, people in residential and community care in Australia are still experiencing violence, abuse and neglect. Why are we not doing something about this? The challenge, of course, is it's a global problem. So I, a number of years ago, I sort of started very tentatively a ban BPSD campaign because I don't believe it even exists. And it was a very lonely experience. A few people joined me, not very many, but a lot of people attacked me, especially researchers and dementia care specialists and I, i've been thinking long and hard about why they would attack me for having a different opinion to them and i think it's probably because it challenged decades of careers and their beliefs the band b psd campaigners have increased it, it, i've got a list that i keep and i it, literally it, um, there are thousands of people now on the list and it includes medical specialists psychologists allied health practitioners, dementia consultants, people with dementia, care partners and researchers. Many have not joined the ban PBSD campaign, however, are writing books and papers on alternatives to the paradigm known as BPSD. So all I can think about that is that they actually agree with the ban BPSD campaign, but they don't want to join it. So, so when someone challenges us, we often react negatively. And, and then we respond by protecting our patch. I, I was in a, a, 
an event in Sydney a few years ago now, and it was a, had a focus on BPSD, and I put in a uh, request, I don't think it was like a normal conference, but I, I, I sent in uh, my request to speak about BPSD, and I was offered a three minute speaking gig. And I used uh, the BPSD symptoms from a website that one of the researchers in attendance had been part of developing. And after my presentation in the morning tea coffee break, I was verbally attacked so much by this woman in the washroom that I had to stay in the toilet for a while to get rid of my tears and to build up the courage to come back and join the event. And then in the taxi to the airport that day, just by fluke, I happened to be with the same person. And she said to me, why did you, why did you pick on me? And wandering, why did you put wandering at the beginning of your list of symptoms of BPSD? And I said, it came straight off the website about BPSD as per the reference that I used on my slides. And then she backed down and she said, oh, God, and I developed that. I helped develop that rep website. So people have been getting, I suppose, nervous about the fact that, that maybe years and years and years of their clinical practice or dementia research is proving to be wrong. So even Stephen Hawking was happy to provoke, prove himself wrong. So we need to think about it really clearly. So normal human responses to dementia, which are currently called BPSD or change behaviours, challenging behaviours, and lots of different terms. This is the list of them. I'm, I'm not going to um, talk about them too much, um, but some people with dementia will have neuropsych. I don't believe the symptoms above are necessarily neuropsychiatric symptoms but things like hallucinations and sometimes anger and disinhibition can obviously be due to the particular type of dementia that a person has, such as Lewy body dementia, where hallucinations are uh, common and the behavioural variant, for example, of frontotemporal dementia. Um, but I, I, and I have a strange theory about confabulation. My young friend who had dementia and had to go into a nursing home at the age of 54, he had vascular dementia and uh, his short and long-term memory was quite impaired. And he used to talk about, I, I had known him really well, and, and I, I wonder about the term confabulation particularly, because he used to tell stories about things that he was doing at the time, but they included true parts of his whole life. So he would bring into a story that he would tell me or the staff, parts of his 20s, parts of his 30s, parts of his 40s, parts of his 50s. So they all made sense and they weren't confabulation unless you didn't know him. So I do have to wonder about all of these terms that we've been labeling people with dementia and holding them to a much higher account to everybody else with. So dementia care, having had to accept it, I can tell you from experience, it's very hard to accept that you need help. It's very hard to accept that you need somebody else to do maths for you or because I don't drive, I need support workers to drive me to places. Um, it would be, I'm sure, very distressing if I needed somebody to come in, undress me and shower me and redress me. I'm not quite sure how I would cope with that. And I'm pretty sure I would experience some significant expressions of distress. Um, but dementia care is caring for people who often don't even know they need care. And they don't want to be in care, so no wonder they may occasionally become angry or upset. So is that the pathology of dementia? Or is that the fact that people don't want other people 
to do things to them or for them. And I've said for a long time that there's a systemic and gross underestimation of the capacity of all people diagnosed with dementia, even in the later stages of the disease. And I think the example of that lady in a nursing home I talked about earlier was a perfect example for that. So the word behaviours, unfortunately, is all, when it's coupled with dementia, apologies for the spelling mistake, it's always used pejoratively. Language matters, and although everyone has behaviours, positive and negative, um, using the word behaviour in dementia is not helpful. They're just a signal of one of the... Behaviours are a signal of one of the best tools we have to understand everyone on a deeper level. And I think that if we applied the same thinking to the way that we bring up children, support children, look after children, understand children, then we stop doing it to people with dementia. So normal human responses to the pandemic, and I call them the behavioral and psychological symptoms of COVID or BPSC. So people since COVID have experienced people with and without dementia, not just people with dementia, they've experienced anxiety and anger and aggression and irritability and trying to escape and sundowning and hoarding and absconding. And an example of hoarding is people buying up, you know, 75 weeks worth of toilet paper. In the early days of COVID, that's what people were doing. On the news, there were... Uh, uh, there was footage of people spitting on fruit and vegetables in a supermarket because they wanted it for them. They didn't want anybody else to get that fruit and veg. Um, if you're a person with dementia doing that, you'd be locked away for sure and medicated. Um, so people experiencing the restrictions that we've all experienced around COVID have also had sleep disturbance and, and been irrational and worried about each other, about our kids, about our colleagues. Um, we, we, it's been more difficult to concentrate and do such simple tasks. And lots of people that I've talked to um, have also experienced waking up in the middle of the night worrying about dementia, uh, about COVID. So what really is the difference to having a diagnosis of dementia? Not very much. So the, the BPSD versus BPSD, and I put it into a, a small kind of table just to highlight that there are a whole lot more symptoms of COVID than there are symptoms of dementia. And yet with COVID, we see them as completely normal human responses but sometimes develop into mental health or neuropsychiatric symptoms, but not always. They're very normal human responses to the COVID pandemic. And yet with the same responses to dementia, people have been held to a higher account, negatively labelled, and most often, particularly in aged care, chemically and physically restrained. So we have to learn from COVID. We don't actually need millions of dollars of new research on this. We can learn this really quickly from COVID. I just, if I can, I want to play a quick video that Dr. Al Power, many of you might have heard of um, on BPSD. Fingers crossed it works. Hi everybody, this is Al Power with my colleague Heather Luth. We're at Schlegel Villages in Ontario, Canada. This year for WRAB 19, we decided to bring you the great old German folk song, The Happy Wanderer, which is sung by millions of people in many different languages. But we've decided to try to reimagine what would happen if the song were sung by a person living with a diagnosis of dementia and observed by maybe a medically oriented person who saw their words and actions as behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So I'm going to sing the actual lyrics to a couple of verses and Heather is going to observe me and tell me what she thinks about my words through that lens. 
I love to go wandering along the mountain track. And as I go, I love to sing my knapsack on my back. Valdery, Valdera, Valdery, Valdera, ha ha ha. Valdery, Valdera, my knapsack on my back. <clears throat> I love to wander by the stream that sparkles in the sun. So joyously it calls to me, come join my hand. says it all um thanks our power uh so the disability of of dementia um most of the neuro so-called neuropsychiatric symptoms are actually disabilities and i i won't um read through them all but you know there are many many others as well uh, and for me i didn't have changes to my very many changes to my memory when i was first diagnosed uh, I didn't even know that I had primary progressive aphasia, but if I had known that, I, as a, a retired nurse, I would have been seeking out speech therapy straight away. Nobody suggested I go to a speech therapist. Um, I did have an acquired dyslexia and there was lots of um, technology that could support me, uh, but nobody actually suggested support for dyslexia. Um, Nobody except my physician suggested any kind of disability support to my loss of depth perception and spatial awareness. Um, so we really need to rethink these symptoms of dementia because they are disabilities, they cause disabilities and many, many, many of them will benefit from rehabilitation and disability support and no, they're not a cure. Rehabilitation is not a cure, but it does improve quality of life. Um, I was at the Rehabilitation 2030 Call for Action Forum in 2019 in Geneva, probably the last uh, event in at the WHO that I attended before COVID, maybe one other. Um, but there was this fantastic guy, Dr. Tumas, who gave a presentation uh, about rehabilitation and this quote has stayed with me i keep the patients alive rehabilitation gives them quality of life and the definition of rehabilitation for those of you that have been nurses when i was a nurse we saw more re recovery we we thought of rehabilitation as full recovery and it's now seen more as about giving people quality of life and improving their well-being not recovery back to what they were before their injury or their illness. So it's important that rehabilitation is provided. So rehab and disability support, um, I believe will reduce the need for chemical and physical restraint. It, it definitely has the potential to increase independence for longer, um, uh, to reduce and i hate using this word but reduce the burden of care partners and families and having been a care partner it does sometimes feel like a burden um, but as a person living with dementia it doesn't feel good being called the reason for someone's burden um, it definitely improves quality of life and well-being uh, it has potential to reduce the human cost of dementia and the economic cost of dementia to families and definitely to reduce um, the need for chemical and physical restraints. And whilst there are no curative 
or disease modifying drugs for dementia, we don't actually have any other options other than non pharmacological strategies such as rehabilitation and proactive disability support. And I do apologize for the spelling on this slide. Um, anyway, I'll update them, Sarah. So we need, uh, it's an urgent call, we need a new pathway of support for everyone at any age diagnosed with dementia. We need a human rights and disability approach. We need to improve the diagnostic experiences, both of getting a diagnosis, and I met someone last week in Australia who took eight years to get a diagnosis. Um, so we do live in the lucky country, um, joke, uh, and the lack of post-diagnostic support that's actually enabling is lacking desperately. We need to advise patients with dementia that they are symptom, their symptoms are disabilities and that people with disabilities can get support and also have rights. Um, we need to provide loss and grief counselling, for not only for the families, but for the person diagnosed. And I um, attempted to... Uh, I asked whether I whether there was support grief support available for people with dementia last year from one of our peak providers and, and was told that I'd have to go and pay for that privately. It was only provided for care partners, um, so we like we need it for everybody, not just the care partners. Um, we need authentic assessment and proactive disability support, not just assessment for our activities of daily living. We need non-pharmacological interventions, especially as there are no um, curative or disease modifying drugs, but dietary lifestyle changes may or may not slow down the progression of dementia, but they, we already know that they impact significantly other chronic health conditions positively, such as heart disease and diabetes. So why wouldn't we be um, recommending them? Um, I have, thankfully been able to self-fund uh, support from exercise physiologists, neurophysiotherapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, and other forms of rehabilitation, very similar to stroke rehab. But without having personal funding to be able to do that, and without having had the ability to think to do that, nobody else recommended it. Um, so we also need dementia enabling environments in the same way we would, by law, actually, we have to provide wheelchair ramps and hearing loops. And I believe we need to work on deinstitutionalization and desegregation uh, and, and move towards small group housing and add in palliative care for everyone, including people with dementia when they're dying, but actually starting from the time of diagnosis, like, like the health system does with someone with cancer or motor neuron disease. So I just want to finish off a couple of slides. Dementia Alliance International, of which I'm a co-founder, provides free membership and free services for all people with dementia. Um, they provide weekly and monthly online peer-to-peer -peer support groups, um, weekly living alone peer-to-peer -peer support groups, one-to-one peer-to-peer mentoring, um, we were providing educational webinars and they're about to recommence and monthly cafes, newsletters, blogs, advocacy, publications and a whole range of other things. Um, but still persistently, most of the peak providers don't refer and healthcare professionals don't yet refer people with dementia to Dementia Alliance International, um, which I'm still banging my head against the wall about. So the because of that, I wanted to provide some feedback that has been received and there's many, many more examples of the feedback. Of course, we get negative feedback too and the negative feedback helps us work towards providing better support groups. But only last week, um, we had a newly diagnosed man at uh, an American support group that I get up at 5.30 in the morning for on a Friday to co-host and I've heard this so many times, but to still be hearing it in 2022 is pretty disturbing. This is the first time I've laughed since my diagnosis two years ago. 
why is that still the case? And then another girl a few weeks ago or earlier this year, and it took me eight years to get a doctor to believe that I had dementia, you know, and then I think it was meant to be then there was no support afterwards. I couldn't really hang around somebody like that who was judging me. That's what I love about these support groups. Yeah, that is what I, this DAI has done for me. You all want, made me want to keep living. So what I don't understand is why organisations don't refer people to Dementia Alliance International. Um, just, oh gosh, that's not working very well. I did want to, I might email you about this one, um, Sarah, to send out to the network. There is a uh, 0.5 position for a project manager um, in a research project that's currently embargoed, but it's a research project about embedding um, rehabilitation into uh, primary healthcare networks. So if anybody uh, is looking for a half-time job and they're based in Melbourne, then this one might be for you. And I'm sorry the slide didn't work. Uh, and I think I've gone even a little bit over uh, an hour, but thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. I hope it hasn't been too boring. Um, and just a reminder that yes, dementia is terminal, but so was being born. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, you've just thrown me with that last comment that yes, dementia is terminal, but so is being born. It sure is. We're all heading there one way or another. Um, your, um, your, your, your reframing of, of the behaviours that uh, researchers and, and our, our, you know, peak bodies are telling us are caused by dementia, I think was really, really interesting. Um, and also the statement you made that a lot of dementia support or dementia care is caring for people who don't know they need to be cared for. That or is what they want to be cared for. Yes. And that is where my disconnect happens and maybe you can help me, but I, I was, I've been talking to quite a few people since we had Daniela's um, session on human rights about locked doors and um, there, there is a, a, somebody who wants to do a project with us about unlocking the doors at a, at a day centre and, and allowing people free ingress and egress and making it a place that people want to be rather than the only reason they can't leave is because of a locked door. And then my sort of funded... 20-year-old funding brain kicks in and says, but what about our um, duty of care to people and what happens if someone gets injured and what do the carers think if we're letting, you know, they know that. So where, where, do, where do we marry up? Have you got any hints for, for me, you know, where I work, marrying up some of those, those disconnects? Well, they're disconnects in my brain anyway. Mm. I, I think... They're, they're really difficult disconnects to respond to, Sarah. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I've got a friend who lives in a yod specific cottage south of Sydney and it's got a fantastic garden outside and, and the facility beyond the garden is completely fenced and secure. Uh, but the residents of that yard facility are not allowed out to the garden, even though the garden area is locked. So that to me just doesn't make sense. We, we need to bring back a bit of common sense. And, yep. you know, I, I'm trying to remember the structure of your service. Oh, I don't expect you to. It was a long time ago. I, I just can't remember whether you had an external fence but that would fix the problem. So people yes. go indoors and outdoors, but not out onto a main road. Yeah. And, and, you know, even me going out onto a main road on my own is not overly safe because of my acquired dyslexia. So I get left and right back to front. If it's a one-way road, I'll be looking the wrong way for oncoming traffic. So I do, you know, I, I can comprehend that challenge from a very personal level. Um but we just have to provide environments where people have freedom to move yes. around. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I'd like to open up the next 10 minutes or so if people have got their own questions. And as Kate requested at the beginning of the meeting, if you wouldn't mind popping your camera on so Kate can see who's asking the question, uh, that would be much appreciated. But we do have Kate here, which is um, a rarity as you flit around doing all your amazing work. <laughs> Are there any questions for Kate? A quick question if that isn't too greedy because I do get to speak to Kate sometimes but something in your uh, presentation stood out to me that I think is um, is important for my understanding I love um, and agree I, I've, I've worked it like you've worked it on the floor in terms of moving away from that medical model um, and moving away from that deficit basis, do you feel that the language and the, and the thinking and the, and the lens around moving beyond the medical model is, is one that focuses on rehabilitation as in your definition of, of rehabilitation, which is um, supporting people to have, um, to, do the, to do the things they want to do in their lives and continue doing in their lives, is that, is that a means, do you ever find you get into uh, the territory of, well, is that still deficit based? Because I've, you know, it's, it's still a gray, it's a gray area when I talk to other people about deficit based and I, in my heart, I know that answer, but I, I'm just feeling yeah. that re rehabilitation described the way you've laid it out is a really, is, is really powerful. Yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to respond, Dan. Um, I, I think that where I'll start with trying to respond to that question is that lots of people more newly diagnosed with dementia, which already has the stigma, you know, the big D word, which in the 70s when I started nursing, it was the big C word. Nobody talked about cancer. We didn't know all the different types of cancer. In fact, patients were kind of hidden in the back wards of hospitals and families didn't visit them for fear of catching cancer. Um, so it was a different type of stigma, but it was still stigma. And, you know, it was a huge conversation about whether we should ditch the word cancer. And the patients used to say, forget about the word, just treat us better. And people like me who've been diagnosed for longer and who have chosen to see the symptoms as disabilities, and I prefer to spell disabilities with a lowercase d and a capital A, um, what that's done for me is helped me fight for and realise some of my rights. Whereas dementia as a medicalised condition only, it, it, there's no rights attached to that. It, for, you know, in the, in the mind of civil society, if that makes sense, um, people don't see us as having rights. I've, I've had heard from a friend in London whose mother actually not long ago died in late stage dementia and one of his friends who was an uh, eminent uh, psychiatrist who deals with older age dementia said to him, but people with dementia don't have rights. You go, wow, <laughs> that's a medical doctor saying that about... <laughs> People like me not having rights. So for me, um, embracing my disabilities has been initially really negative and, dis and not disabling but distressing, but it's ultimately been incredibly empowering uh, and enabling. And so when, when I was receiving services, uh, community care services through aged care, all they ever wanted to do was do for me and, you know, the first assessment I had after my ACAT, which I had when I was 50, um, was put in a shower rail and put in a ramp at the front door and start doing four. And then, thank God, um, I could move to the NDIS. And I know the NDIS is not yet perfect, but they knew nothing about dementia. Aged care workers know bugger all about dementia either. Um, but they knew everything about how to support me to keep doing the things I want to do. So that's why I 
really love the disability rights movement because it's about providing me support to keep living Kate Swaffer's life, not give up living. And, uh, you know, maybe on the news last night, I was, there was some race in Adelaide at the moment, uh, some sort of dirt bike race and a guy who became a paraplegic a few years ago who obviously couldn't ride dirt bikes and now they've adapted dirt bikes to become three-wheelers and so he's still racing. You know, that's not a negative outcome from accepting disability. That's a really positive outcome. And I, and I honestly believe, and I, I don't have any data to support it, but I honestly believe if we could just get researchers and service providers and healthcare professionals to just do a little tweak in their thinking about dementia symptoms as disabilities, we would, would, would really improve outcomes for people with dementia of every age. That's an amazing response. Thank you very much, Kate. That's swimming around. How can we get peer groups into residential aged care? What was that question? How can we get these amazing peer groups into residential aged care? Ah, see, I think we've got to ditch residential aged care, but that's a yeah. whole other lecture. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. But do you think... Um, for, that they'd be helpful to people, even in group homes? Yeah, they'd definitely be helpful. But, you know, when my young friend who had vascular dementia and multiple other horrific health conditions and he'd had brain tumours 30 years before and he had some really rare conditions from the radiotherapy, he, had, he was still living alone, getting some help in, he couldn't drive anymore and at the age of 54 he tripped on a rug at home and ended up in one of our major hospitals here in Adelaide and in a three-month period he went from mobile and continent to never walking again and incontinent and on a gurney sent forced actually we were forced to take any nursing home bed available in the end because he'd become a bed blocker, uh, he went into residential care and it wasn't actually the best place overall. It turned out to be lots of neglect and abuse, but the initial uh, admission was really good. And I'd been told that my friend, who I was legal guardian for and a, a long-time friend of, was in palliation mode that he couldn't swallow, he couldn't eat, he couldn't drink. And day two of being in the residential care facility, he was back eating and drinking because his oral thrush was so bad. He had no oral health care at the Royal <coughs> Hospital. If I, I shouldn't have said that word. Can we cut that bit out? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, it actually, it's in a blog in my on my website. The care at that hospital was so bad, no physio, no AT, no oral care, nothing. We used to turn up, we, I used to visit nearly every day, I'd turn up at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon with an untouched breakfast tray and a used urinal bottle on his overway table. It was just extraordinary. That experience had me sobbing being ashamed to have ever been a nurse because I couldn't believe it would be happening to someone. And that's only about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, so when we called, we had lots of meetings and made lots of complaints and we had a massive meeting with the hierarchy of the hospital. And one of the young OTs who spoke out of turn when I said, well, why isn't this man being provided with physio and other allied health support? She said, she was the only honest one there, she said, well, he's got dementia in his case notes and we don't provide that for people with dementia. So that's only just over a decade ago. Um, but there's this therapeutic nihilism that it doesn't matter what you do, it's no use for people with dementia. Well, it's a huge benefit to people with dementia. And indirectly, it greatly benefits our families, like me having rehab and you know, <coughs> being willing to 
accept care. And I did put up a slide about how hard it is to accept care. It, it's, and I don't think it's an age thing. I think if I was 90, and I know from my aunt who had to accept in-home care, she was just as pissed off about it as I was. To accept help, accept that you need someone to take you to appointments, that you might need someone to remind you to eat, to use Webster packs for your medication. And, you know, I rejected some of that support for at least a couple of years. But then I started to think about it. Well, I needed reading glasses about 25 years ago. So why don't I think of those supports like reading glasses? They're going to help me live independently. But that's a big shift in thinking. But now I sort of see Webster packs just as a pair of glasses. And I see phone reminders and then reminders from my husband or whoever around me um, when they say, Kate, have you remembered you've got an appointment tomorrow? Or Kate, have you remembered such and such? Or, uh, you know, all those things that I do need support to do. Like I, I, I had a very high level of maths ability and I can't even use a calculator now. Well, I think I stressed and was distressed and cried over that for a couple of years. And then I just went, stop it, you know, stop doing that. Just pretend they're your glasses, reading glasses. And now I just sent an email to my husband who still can do maths. So in three seconds, I've got a reply with a maths problem solved and I haven't put myself through two hours of stress. Yeah. But it takes time to get there. And if you think about a person with more advanced dementia who maybe can't, and it took me a couple of years to do that thinking, someone who's more advanced in their dementia maybe not won't have that ability to think that through. No wonder they're not happy about being in care. Yeah. Kate, I um, part of what you said was um, how good the supports from the NDIS are because they look at it as a, a group of disabilities that you can be assisted to function and live your life with. I know there's a lot of work going on in other organisations, not dementia-specific ones, about, um, again, the inequality between someone getting a disease at 64 and a half and being um, eligible for NDIS and getting it at 65 and having to go into the aged care system and just, the dis again, that huge disparity between the amount and the um, number of different services you can get on NDIS as compared to the amount you can get on a home care package level four. Do you know if anyone's it's working on that? It's completely discriminatory. Sorry? It's completely discriminatory against older people. Do you know if anyone's working on that or making that known or...? Um... Uh, numerous people on social media like me do highlight okay. that. But I don't know if any organisation per se like OPAN or Dementia Australia or anybody else is actively working in that space. I'm not personally because I've, my focus has really been more on human rights and disability rights now yeah. and, and, and I also have a disturbing belief that 30 to 40 years of advocacy by both individuals living with dementia, care partners of people with dementia and the dementia charities hasn't worked. I absolutely believe that's gone nowhere. And, you know, that old saying, if you're happy, keep doing what you've always done. If you're not happy, then you have to change something. And so I'm trying to change the way that I had been as an activist or an advocate, whatever you want to call me, um, I just think that we've failed miserably. Uh, yeah. And when I meet somebody and I meet newly diagnosed people every week because of Dementia Alliance International, what happened to me 14 years ago and what happened to Christine Bryden and James McKillop and loads of other people I know who were still alive in the last century is still happening in September 2020. 
what the hell happened to all that money that's been spent on advocacy? All that's done is give jobs to people without dementia, in my opinion. Yeah. So it's tricky. You Very know, tricky. it's really tricky. And, and we just have to start thinking differently yeah. because, you know, I, I'm currently doing a literature review on stigma and dementia and I'm going back 20 years, in fact, and 20 years of stigma research has had exactly the same outcome. There's nothing changed in 20 years. So, so we are doing something wrong. We, the collective, not me personally and not this group personally, yeah, yeah, yeah. we, the collective, have got it wrong. We have to change what we're doing. Kate, I, when you find out what it is, I'll let you could, know. Could you let us all know, please? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I'm still working on it, and that's why I've, I've changed my focus, really. Yeah. Uh, well, I, okay. I thank, thank you again. I know people are, it's the late in the afternoon, people are, yeah. are go, going to go. Thank you again so much from me personally. Um, for you coming along. This recording will be available with the name of the hospital bleeped out um, <laughs> on our web, on our YouTube and I will send around a link. Um, thank you to all of you for attending um, and we'll see you at the next meeting. And I will send you that uh, half-time job opportunity too. Okay, great. I'll send that round. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.